Bob Greenier and I am a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today I'm going to talk about a presentation that was part of the Russian weekly presentations that was conducted on Wednesday the 16th of March 2022 and the presentation was given in Russian and the slides were given in Russian but I took the slides and I have done a rough translation of them and I'm going to talk through them uh, quickly with, at the best of my ability. And this is work that was conducted and then presented by V. Zhigalov, and it is Tracks of Strange Radiation from Incandescent Lamps and from Electrolysis. So he did a quick summary of the work from 2017 to 2019, and I strongly recommend you go and look at the actual presentation that he presented in Russian and used the ability of YouTube to take the Russian transcription and auto transcribe to the language of your choice. So these are his uh, previous results summary 2017 to 2019. They used two types of reactors to observe tracks, a nickel hydrogen and a plasma electrolysis using optical, electronic, and ASM microscopes. A methodology for numerical estimation has been developed during that time, and intensities of strange radiation tracks, as well as statistics of tracks at different distances from the reactors were established. And this was Zhigalov, Zabavin, Parkamov, Sobolev, Timur Butalov, and so forth. And you can see the uh, paper down there that is listed. There may be some acronyms that are wrong, and there may be some translation words uh, that have been incorrectly translated, but uh, this is what I can do at this time. So you can see here on the 49 exposures uh, below 20 centimeters, the total track lengths on a typical DVD was uh, between not a lot in the sort of 20 area all the way up to sort of around about 1950 uh, millimeters per DVD and you can see the I guess the average there is around about uh, just under 1000 millimeters on DVDs that were at a distance of less than 20 centimeters. For those that were at greater than 20 centimetres, 30 exposures thereof, it ranged from zero uh, tracks to uh, somewhere, I guess, around about 80 or so, uh, with an average of maybe uh, 50 millimetres. The distance dependence uh, is given in the chart below, and so he has a distance from reactor centimeters 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. And he is saying that in the near zone, less than 20 centimeters from the reactor, the intensity of the tracks exceeds the intensity in the far zone. That is at greater than 20 centimeters by an order of magnitude. As you can see, that clearly is demonstrated there. The variation of track intensity the la length of the tracks varies greatly from exposure to exposure by an order of magnitude. There is variation in both the near and far zones. At the same time, a large number of tracks, greater than 500 millimeters, occurs only in the near zone. There are no patterns in the variation in time and location of disks found in the near zone. So here's an example of uh, DVDs. These are kind of rewritable uh, DVDs, uh, photos thereof, and on the left you can see there is a control that is in a hood, and there is one uh, which is 10 centimeters, i.e. within the very active area of the woodpecker device. And if you recall, the woodpecker device is sort of like a solenoid that drops uh, the electrode down onto the counter electrode and that makes a connection uh, and that forces current through the solenoid which pulls up the uh, electrode against gravity and it produces a spark as the field collapses from the breaking of the connection. And you can go and look at Woodpecker on the MFMP's 
Facebook uh, uh, or other channels to see uh, documents relating to that. So here's uh, what he is calling twin tracks and these are sort of ones where you have lines either side of each other and you can see that some of these also have some sort of spatial correlation to them but this is uh, one type of tracks and this is on mica and then these are uh, images with a optical microscope and scanning electron microscope of the track structure on a DVD and uh, you can see the repeating nature on the right and because you can create some types of tracks like this from grit uh, in a three-body interaction for me personally and this is my personal view here uh, you can maybe uh, see things that look like strange radiation tracks but are in fact something rolling along the surface uh, and actually causing damage to the surface and it's, it's uh, just a physical bit of grit and anyway that being said we also know from the Bogdanovich work on long-lived plasmoids that the exotic vacuum objects the plasmoids as they refer to them can cluster together into crystal structures and that these can rotate and translate across surfaces and the understanding is that these things have a higher binding energy than all ordinary matter and so you would imagine that these things could also leave something that looked like a crystal grain rolling across the surface and I've discussed this with respect to Amasa vibrator plates and Matsumoto's work as well. So here's a close-up of this uh, very very similar structure and uh, if this was to occur uh, on this previous slide here it's gone down to that bottom point then changed direction and rolled up and it just happens to um, have this uh, perfect uh, or seemingly near perfect uh, kind of form between the tracks and if you're going to think of something that whether it is a plasmoid cluster an evo cluster or a physical piece of grit that has bits that juts out and as that interacts with a solid piece of material that might leave an indentation okay so continued research from 2020 21 a lot of that previous work was presented in sochi in 2018 and you may have seen it before you can go and look for it on our channel so the background here is the use of uh, incandescent light bulbs typically uh, tungsten filament halogen bulbs and there are other presentations that refer to this again this is Parkamov and Karabanov and investigation of elemental and isotopic changes in matter near incandescent lamps and I think the thing that you need to really look here and he highlighted it is one thing that I picked up during the live presentation was that in the before when they are looking at uh, the material they observed 99.91 percent potassium in the witness material liquid I think it was and much less than 0 0.01 uh, percent calcium and after the experiment you have 86.4 percent potassium so the potassium has gone down by essentially the best part of 13 and a half percent and the calcium presumably this is atoms has gone up but from basically nothing to have a proportion of around about 10% in the uh, elements detected. Other elements that have gone up is copper here and you have some zinc going up and some uh, change in nickel but nowhere near as much as you're observing with this massive change in calcium and there is this known transmutation between potassium and calcium. Okay so results of analysis of potassium nitrate I think uh, solutions or whatever uh, by uh, RFA and ICPMS methods before and after treatment in the installation of the KNO3 solution mass percentages so yes that is mass percentages not uh, element percentages um, well definitely you would expect it in the <laughs> mass spectrometry um, you can see here in the ICPMS the aluminium has gone up very very significantly here and also you can see the copper so there's a cop rise in copper 
um, both in the RFA analysis and the uh, ICPMS. So here is our typical arrangement. So we have DVDs, uh, horizontal and at a distance, horizontal and above, horizontal, uh, vertical and to the side, and over uh, this uh, fluid reservoir, I guess it is. Um, and it appears that they have a heat exchanger over here, uh, maybe to cool it down. So obviously this is heating the water up and they are, they've got some fluid movement around there and there's a, the measurements involved. Results of this exposure, uh, different dates. This is nine, uh, the 1st of the 7th, uh, 2nd of the 7th, 3rd of the 7th. So you seem to have more um, things on this particular day. Um, I don't know whether we are looking at millimeters generated or the, the reactor worked in a total uh, of 34 hours. Okay, so I guess it was on and off during these periods. Um, and this is the control, uh, I guess, disks at a distance. So less than 20 centimeters, you have just under 900, I guess, millimeters of tracks and uh, greater than 20 centimeters basically negligible so this was uh, nine exposures using 46 discs so a similar story is being told and the distance dependence here you have the exposed uh, cds all the way over here so it's even up to here yeah, you've basically got this big clustering down here at uh, less than 20 centimeters there were some control CDs over here that recorded some kind of tracks at quite some distance, so that's four meters away, and uh, uh, but still the total track length is vastly smaller than this. Distance dependence, uh, so I guess this is much. Uh, this is going into this data over here and uh, magnifying this area up here, and so these are these uh, two units here. I think we're missing the one which is. I guess beyond 30 here which has no no uh, millimeters on it anyway so it's basically irrelevant and so you can see below 20 there's the big cluster there um, that's producing most of the track data and this is the variability and speed of accumulation so uh, I think over different events or whatever there was a, a rate of production of tracks speed of accumulation of tracks millimeters per hour so uh, I guess is this an hour? Um, maybe, I don't know, or is it a particular day? I don't know. Anyway, red indicates the exposures with freshly supplied lamps. Okay, so it would appear that with a new lamp, uh, you're getting a burst, and then it kind of tails off. So we have new lamp here, nothing, nothing, and then something. Uh, new lamp, uh, a burst, and then not so much. And then, so, you know, could it be some sort of transmutation effect that's causing some sort of... Uh, emissions that then do not persist because there's uh, no more of that particular isotope or is it because there's something accumulated in the metal and then that gets released and after that there's no more accumulated and so forth so things to consider and they established this new type of track uh, uh, and they call it drip tracks now you know I think from, from the discussion, they go in all kinds of directions. So we have uh, these ones going down like this, but then here we've got them going across as well as down. And so the argument that it's just uh, gravity and it's a liquid drop that's moving down and leaving a bit of it behind progressively doesn't really uh, wash here. Experiments with electrolysis, so... Um, sulfuric acid or whatever it is, H2SO4 plus uh, nickel. Current of the order of around one amp measured by gamma background Geiger counter. Tracks of strange radiation accumulate on DVD. There are tracks of strange radiation from electrolysis. Three exposures of four discs were held. And so I think this is the little electrolysis device that was generated and uh, it has a, a lead base here. The DVDs are arranged around it in this fashion uh, with this uh, rather nice little sort of wire support where you just hook on the DVD and you're good to go. 
and then there you have another lead block above and I guess you've got some sort of counter over here and uh, you, you've got a little window where the emissions I supposedly can come out and so that's the setup of that and the total track length from electrolysis here uh, we have uh, and I, I haven't translated these, I'm, I'm sorry, um, but uh, under the exposed one, we've got a whole bunch of uh, track links and under the controls, uh, basically a null result. From the electrolysis number two, again, nearly null result on the controls and the exposed have um, a bunch of tracks on them. Here, the total track length from electrolysis number three. Uh, I guess they've done away with the controls in this, and you're seeing that there are some track lengths. Drip tracks occur in an aerosol medium during electrolysis. Tracks are long, composed of droplets on the surface of the disc, and drops of different diameters. And so this is the apparent um, track type that is being referred to here. And... Uh, you know, it does look like drips and uh, very accurately describing these as having different scales. And, you know, I, I can't help think of water running down um, a piece of plastic or a glass and leaving a bit of itself behind based on some sort of surface interaction forces. But anyway, um, this is what's being talked about here. And... Here is an example of, I guess, a large droplet drying out and leaving this structure here. There's a smaller one here. So uh, I think I don't know whether this is meant to be atomic force microscope tracks. This might be the, the wrong translation here. But anyway, this is optical microscope, and he's blown these out, and you're getting these uh, sort of straighter sections here and then this thing here. And again, it really does look... Uh, like uh, three-body interaction, but anyway, um, that is something that he does recognize later on, but it's like the the solid thing, which may be super solid, i.e. it's more, more binding energy than any other element, can act like something interacting with a solid body, but, you know, why does it do it? Um, so here it is. This is actually definitely an AFM, and you can see it produces this rather nice sort of 3D structure down here, so I guess this is an SEM, and you can see the scale profile here. So it's it's moving down about one micrometer here, and then it's going up in the middle here by 0.5 of a micrometer, where it's interacting. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, and here is that scrape section again with the scales. Here you can look at this in your own time. And here are some tracks, and there's a big blob here. I might have done better by translating these so we know what we're talking about here, but uh, what I'll do is probably I'll update the PDF that you will be able to access um, with additional uh, translation, so using the same link. So one thing that he did uh, talk about quite a bit, which is new research aspect, is that over the length of the track, uh, the periodicity between the features uh, alters. And this kind of, it maybe suggests uh, that it's not a crystal that's rolling at a continuous speed. Uh, for this to occur, so you've got, for instance, this is A, B, C, D. So along the track length, it's A, B, C, D, bottom up movement. So... I guess from the bottom up and you can see this is 199.5 this is 198.05 this is 194.31 and this is 189 so as it's progressing along the track the distance between the repeated features is getting smaller well this could be from maybe the driving force is less intense and it's doing less slipping before it rotates or that it is a plasmoid cluster type structure and it's losing energy and it's kind of to a degree shrinking or maybe it was getting bigger in the losing of energy and going in the other right direction and it's relaxing and coming out. So in my mind, that's how I would see it occurring if it was 
some sort of um, exotic object rather than ordinary matter object. The other option is maybe that it is breaking down in some way, but then uh, that doesn't really explain why you have essentially the same marks in the uh, so-called period track parts. So uh, I think this is something to do with breaking up here. Uh, so it's either it touching the surface here and going along here or going along here and then breaking up. So that, that might be what's occurring. This looks like it's slipping and so on. So And again, here, this is from A, B, C, D, movement from left to right along the track. So A, B, C, D, so we're moving along from here. And this is 85.25, getting bigger to 90.02, uh, getting slightly bigger to 90.11, and then getting bigger again to 92.11. So again, what you can think about this varies on whether you're going forward or backwards along the track. And uh, but it's, it's it's a good observation that has been made here by V. Shigalov. Okay, the double track here. You've got things on either side here, and we're looking up this close. And you can again see. Now the interesting thing about this is uh, you're going A B C D, and this is going from left to right. Look at the top one. It's going 52.96, 51.24. 57.29, 67, so it's kind of like goes down and then it goes up. And then the one on the bottom here goes 50.47 at 51.69, 56.5, 65. So the one on the bottom is increasing in size. So could it be that um, as this is moving along, that part of the structure is breaking up or losing energy and uh, it's kind of tilting over to one side um, and then resulting in one getting shorter and the other one getting longer. That could be potentially what's going on here in my mind. I, I don't know whether something like that was discussed in the live stream, but perhaps it was. So there's this, and so he's saying here particle destruction. So you can see it's coming down here and then something happens here and a bit of it goes off, off there. So, you know, there is some thinking along these lines. And here's uh, more examples, I guess. Uh, this looks like something being broken up here, something changing here. So he's, he's analyzing this overall mark here. Now these are smooth tracks where you can imagine something's being somehow pushed along the surface and uh, gouging a channel. And again, for me, these tracks are potentially you know, a physical thing, whether that's a exotic physical thing or a normal form physical thing moving along. The question is, why do you only see them near within the near area of a reactor, and if that and not at a distance and not as a control, and why does it vary depending on whether you have a new filament and uh, or an old filament? So he's done, again, some AFM work here to look at this more closely. And here you can see uh, the cross-section of the channel. And he's using this information to estimate the diameter of the potential particle that caused the damage. So he's saying maybe between 6.5 and 8 microns on the, uh, I guess he's saying diameter, so that must be across the whole thing uh, rather than radius, which is there. Again, this is a 3D view of this smooth track, as he calls. Now, here he's saying that the attempts to repeat the HB reactor at Miet, several designs of reactors where incandescent lamps were made. As a result, a fairly accurate replication of the HB reactor was made. Tracks from any design in Miet could not be obtained. Okay, now uh, this is their reactor's designs, uh, flow-through reactors with LN. So there we go. And I guess this is the heat exchanger here that you saw uh, off camera before. Power input 450 watts, temperature between 2700 and 2800 degrees in the filament, I would imagine. Uh, and this was with water circulation. Again, you can see the um, CDs there. Eight exposures were held with a total time of 177 hours. There are no tracks from the reactors at Miet. Now, uh, when I'm looking at this, I don't see any windows, and this might be important as far as I'm concerned. 
Possible causes, lamp. Okay, so if it's an old lamp, maybe it didn't work because they identified that a new lamp worked. Location dependency. I think this is very, very important. I think that if the technology is um, cohering relic neutrinos and you are in a basement, these basement areas, unless they have some uh, feng shui uh, to let uh, the environment move through the environment, uh, if it has no windows and stuff, I think that the uh, living organisms will absorb these relic neutrinos and uh, not allow them to be available for clustering. And so that might be potentially what's going on. Um, and I, I mentioned the fact that Shishkin said that his cavitator worked for a little period of time and then he would have to move it to a different part of his lab. And I argued that this is because there's an event horizon where these uh, counter-rotating vortices that are formed either electromagnetically uh, or uh, hydrodynamic leading to electromagnetically end up cohering this uh, material uh, with a fall off and so uh, I think if this was in a basement I, the first thing I would do is try and conduct these things outside where Perovozhikov was able to absorb these things from uh, the uh, the how should we say this the cosmogenic uh, flux into water and so I think that's very very key so I think probably the location dependence is is more important also dependence on water um, if I believe that there's not oxygen dissolved in the water then uh, you're not going to get the large clusters forming uh, or uh, I believe it's a, an important aspect of it um, so th there may also be need in, in some need for uh, these structures to have already absorbed into the water so yes dependence on water could be a very very uh, important factor dependence on the environment as I've discussed with the location dependency so location dependency might be down to the fact that you need to be uh, it, it could actually be because maybe there's some radon in the environment and that somehow interacts with the process whereas in the um, lab that they tried the replication that wasn't available or, or vice versa uh, some factor like that uh, dependence on voltage possibly uh, or some other and I've given some examples of what that might be variability in speed of accumulation of tracks again I think we are seeing this slide from before and so he's referring to this first point uh, here the lamp being new speed of accumulation so he's talking about the fact that when it's new uh, that could be a factor and I believe that since we know exotic vacuum objects, uh, whether they're from the environment or, or synthetic, they will store themselves in metals in, in indefinitely and you can force them to be released. Um, we know from the induced exotic vacuum objects into ultrasonically treated uh, echo fuel that they dissipate over time. I imagine if we heated up that echo fuel, as was done with... Um, uh, lion fuel and with the Baranoff and Zatalef in bismuth I think or ex re-exposed to sunlight you can then reinvigorate or release them at a, a different rate so uh, I think this is a, a very key factor here. Testing the hypothesis about the lamps in the reactor HV of the kit laboratory the same lamps were placed as they were in the Miet reactors that should be another uh, bullet point Three exposures in kit with Miet lamps, uh, th tracks were also virtually not received. So, um, uh, okay, so they used the same lamps that they used in Miet and they, it, but in the kit laboratory, and it did not work. So, it's something maybe to, to do with the um, history. So, I guess this is the total track length over time and this is uh, uh, speed uh, so this is the rate of production um, so yeah this, this is a very interesting point here um, that their lamps uh, did not uh, show really any uh, production of tracks when they moved them to the kit laboratory so the location is is discounted so it may be more to do with the lamps themselves Preliminary conclusions about replication attempts. Incandescent lamps can be a source of strange radiation. Strange radiation comes out more intensely from fresh lamps. Not all lamps are sources of strange radiation. Perhaps the prehistory of the lamps manufacture storage is important. I believe this to be the case. 
Some conclusions. Reactors, HV laboratories, kit, halogen incandescent lamps and water are an effective source of strange radiation. Preliminary results show that electrolysis is also an effective source of strange radiation tracks. A new type of tracks uh, has been identified, drip tracks manifested in the aerosol gas from electrolysis. Now, I would refer you to a recent presentation that I made about the uh, cavitation and sound and vibration uh, zaser effect uh, or that was researched by Alicorn Nova and uh, Vladimir Vysotsky from 2004 onwards and first published in 2007, but first given a public presentation, uh, first as a, a, a poster session in 2013 at ICCF 18 in Missouri, and then later at the MIT conference in 2014. So I did a blog on that recently, and this is that Caraboot's work and other work from cavitation, these kind of um, x-rays that are observed uh, could be due to um, the shock wave that's produced by uh, first the collapsing cavitation bubble producing soft x-rays uh, at about 1 kV that come, come out and immediately get absorbed by the local water. This produces a, a shock wave and that travels through the water to the metal, through the metal, and when it gets to the backside, it produces, uh, 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 it reflects. Uh, in my view, this forms, it forms a phase conjugation and you get excitation and transverse excitation to the surface. And this leads to excited, coherent atoms that relax, uh, emitting x-rays. And depending on the, temp uh, the type of metal that is used, the, you get higher and higher x-rays so if you're using something like aluminium the x-rays will be uh, of lower energy than if you are using lead with lead producing x-rays of the order of about seven and a half kilo uh, uh, electron volts and i believe that uh, this explains russ george's 1990s uh, experiment and i will talk about that in another time so um so more conclusions, the hypothesis of the formation of strange radiation tracks by the movement of solid particles of micron size is confirmed. So something is solid or possibly, as I'm saying, super solid if you have something with a binding energy higher than the um, than normal matter. The particles themselves undergo gradual destruction during the track formation. And probably the material of these particles can be found out by examining the tracks using the VIMS method. So maybe this is SIMS method, I don't know, but anyway. Um, they need to see if there's any traces on there. The nature of the particles and the forces pressing them against surfaces are not yet clear. The reason for the, the great variability in the intensity of SR tracks is also not yet clear. And I think I've made some arguments that these things are coherent matter and that they uh, interact with material in a way to damage it or, or produce polarization in it. And when they collapse, wherever they collapse, they'll leave a fragment. And we've observed things that look like these tracks in the form of silver, copper, and diamond to date. Okay, and so this is the literature. So this was my read-through with a couple of comments. Uh, I hope I did uh, the Zhigalov, uh, Vlad, a, a, a fair run of what I got from the presentation this is excellent work and uh, i think we we need to kind of we, we <laughs> there were comments after the presentation that look this is accepted we know these things exist um and uh, uh let's try and move to um making a broader acceptance of what strange radiation is and uh, find out what is actually causing these uh, tracks so thank you very much for your time and i will see you in the next video